Hi everyone and welcome to the session on trust, misinformation and the role of technology in the localization of information. My name is Zoe Hamilton and I'm a Senior Insights Manager on GSMA's Mobile for Humanitarian or M4H team. As you all know, this ALNAP meeting is looking at learning emerging from disruption. We know that disruption creates fertile ground for learning as organizations and individuals adapt their approaches to the changes that are happening around them. We also know that experience suggests that change in the humanitarian system, particularly transformational change, may have more to do with the influence of external forces than planned internal shifts. This session is going to focus on the role of digital technology and managing and leading disruption. If you're interested in this theme, please check out the agenda for other sessions within this series. So today we have for you a panel discussion bringing together three leading organizations working in the humanitarian space. Together, we'll be discussing the role of mobile technology over the course of COVID-19 in delivering information. As the pandemic has demonstrated, in a crisis, almost nothing is as, is as important as timely, trustworthy, and actionable information. Absent that, there's the risk of misinformation and disinformation spreading in a vacuum. Due to the circumstances of the pandemic, mobile technology came to play a very important role in disseminating this information. And while digital channels provided the benefit of social distance and therefore safety, it also created its own challenges, especially in terms of building trust with users. In this session, we'll hear about the approaches taken by three different organizations, the IRC, Solidarité Internationale and Sesame Workshop to deliver locally relevant information through trusted sources in the context of the pandemic. All three of these organizations are former or current grantees of M4H's Innovation Fund and we wanted to highlight some of the key learnings from their programming. So in terms of how this session is going to run, we're going to start with a brief introduction from each panelist on their work. Uh, following the introductions, we'll have a panel discussion. If you could please write your comments and questions in the chat along the right hand side or in the chat function on Slido. You can also vote for the questions that you find most relevant. We're hoping to have a lot of questions by the time we get to the end of the panel discussion. My colleague Guy is also taking notes on the Miro board that's attached to this session. So please feel free to check that and to post questions there as well. Um, now, to get us started with the introductions, I'm going to hand over to, to Katie Sussman from the IRC to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her work. Over to you, Katie. Thank you, Zoe. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Sussman. I'm the Deputy Director for Programs in Northern Central America, based in El Salvador, um, it, for the IRC, International Rescue Committee. Uh, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about our um, information and service platform, Quentinos. It's an interactive mobile um, enhanced platform. It provides access to life-saving and uh, life-sustaining information uh, for vulnerable populations. Um, particularly in the GSMA project, we focused on um, women, girls, and the LGBTQI population. Um, and uh, it, it, it really harnesses digital technology, um, connects people to information services, live moderation, um, access to um, different uh, types of information for current events um, and those that can potentially be affected by violence and, and displacement in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, Quentinos is part of our larger signpost uh, initiative as IRC. Uh, signpost is a global interactive um, information platform that is functioning and um, many IRC countries uh, across the, the globe at this point. Um, and I, I did want to share with you all uh, a video just to give you an idea of, of how Quintinus works and what it looks like um, from the eyes of a, of a past client that we had. Um, so I will uh, ask you all to share the video now. Cuéntanos para mí es algo que cambió mi vida, cambió eh, muchas cosas. Eh, les comento que cuando yo conocí de Cuéntanos, lo hice por las redes sociales en Facebook. 
cuéntanos, yo estaba pasando por unos problemas terribles y claro, cuéntanos, cuando yo le pregunté, me mandaron números inmediatamente, me contactaron con un, con un psicólogo, eh, luego estaba pasando por lo que era la pandemia, problemas económicos, porque créanme que, que lo estén sacando a uno de la casa, eso es terrible, no tener que darle a sus hijos. Y cuéntanos, hizo realidad mi sueño de poder ayudar a mi familia, de poder ayudar a mis hijos. Tengo pequeñitos de un año, de cuatro meses, eh, que son mis nietos, pero me los dejaron a mi cargo. Personas que vea esto que crea, cuéntanos, es algo eh, que puede cambiar el estilo de, de vida que llevamos. Ellos pueden ayudarle con un psicólogo, con médicos, con personas que conozcan de leyes que estén viendo este video. Les digo, cuéntanos para mí, cambió mi vida y es algo muy importante. Lo, de, lo guardo aquí en mi corazón. Un saludito para todos y vamos, echémosle gana como mujeres que somos. Thank you. So that just shares a little bit uh, about the impact of, of the Quintinos platform on our clients. And uh, something really interesting about Quintinos that we uh, have seen in the past um, two years has been that we have gone from, from starting with uh, five users the first, uh, the, the, the first month two months and we were we were counting we got really excited when we got to 12 and uh we've now uh reached uh over a hundred thousand um and so just the 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 amount of increase in use um uh, particularly throughout this pandemic time has really shown us the the power of of, of digital technology over to you zoe great thanks so much katie i'd now like to hand over to kim fold from sesame workshop Thanks, Zoe. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Folds. I'm Vice President of Content Research and Evaluation at Sesame Workshop. Um, I'm going to be sharing a bit more about our program in partnership with GSMA called Ahan Simpson, an interactive mobile extension. And what it is is an extension of a, a larger grant that we received in partnership with IRC um, called Ahan Simpson, which is the creation of a television show in service of children affected by the Syrian civil war, um, as well as uh, a variety of community engagement and direct services to support um, children and parents of young children. And so what the work that we did um, on this initiative really leveraged the power of mobile technology among a highly connected community across the region. Um, and then we also, knowing that we are creating engaging uh, research-backed content to support socio-emotional development for among Syrian refugee families, we wanted to then extend that to create content in support of parents of young children. Um, so focusing on six core categories, uh, including the impact of parenting on early brain building, the importance of play for early childhood development, understanding uh, my stress, my being the parent, um, my child's stress, empathy, nutrition, gender equity, and early childhood. We created uh, six five minute, what we call short form videos that uh, were distributed through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube that really uh, provided parents with the science-backed information as well as modeling of these different um, skills so that they could then integrate them into their own parenting practices. We wanted to leverage mobile technology so that we could achieve this at scale. Um, again, distributing through YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, as part of this work and in, in our general organizational process to content creation, we conducted formative research with Syrian parents in Jordan and Lebanon um, to really guide content creation. And then we also conducted a series of performance evaluations to understand um, the ways that parents imagined using these videos in their own lives with their own families um, to help us understand the appeal, the relevance, and ultimately applicability at home and any potential ways that they could support any behavior change. And so because the videos can speak for themselves far, far better than I can, um, we wanted to give you uh, a short snippet of one of the videos, particularly the one, the impact on parenting on early brain building, which we've seen from reach data 
is by far the most popular video for parents to engage in. Um, so we're going to watch the first three minutes of the video. It's in Arabic, but it does have English subtitles. هل تعلم أن تسعين بالمئة من بناء الدماغ يكتمل عند بلوغ الطفل عامه الخامس؟ وهل تعلم أن التجارب التي يمر بها الطفل في السنوات الأولى من حياته تؤثر بشكل دائم في بناء الدماغ لديه؟ نعم، فالطفل يتعلم الكثير في السنوات الأولى مثل الحبو والمشي والكلام وتناول طعامه بنفسه ثم يتعلم القيام بأشياء أكثر تعقيداً مثل الحساب والتخطيط والتفكير وغيرها وحين يمر الطفل بتجارب إيجابية مع الكبار من حوله فإن ذلك يساعد في تكوين الروابط بين الخلايا العصبية في الدماغ وكلما مر الطفل بتجارب إيجابية أخرى فإن هذا سيؤدي إلى تقوية هذه الروابط وبناء المهارات المختلفة وهكذا يحدث التعلم تعالوا لنشاهد تمام تخيل قرية فيها مليار منزل صغير وأن هناك العديد من الشجيرات الطويلة والعشب الكثيف بين البيوت ولا توجد ممرات تربط بينها فهذا يعني أنه لا توجد علاقات بين الناس ولا ذكريات مشتركة ولا حتى حياة مجتمعية تمام هاد بيتي وهاد بيت بسمة وهاد بيت معزوزة تشبه هذه القرية دماغ المولود قبل تكوين الروابط بين الخلايا العصبية في دماغه تمام التمام جاد شو حلوة قريتك شكرا هادي طب شو هدول الأشرطة الملونة هاي آه. عم بعمل طريق من بيتي لبيت بسمة حطيت شارع حلو كتير هيك انت وبسمة بتقدروا تزوروا بعض وهلأ بدي ساوي طريق من بيتي لبيت معزوزة الوصلات العصبية في الدماغ تشبه إلى حد ما المسارات بين هذه المنازل فالمسارات الأكثر استخداماً من قبل القرويين تصبح واضحة وواسعة أما المسارات التي لا يتم استخدامها كثيراً فتصبح مغطاة بالأعشاب الضارة وحين يتعرض الطفل للمزيد من التجارب فهذا يساعد في تكوين روابط قوية بين الخلايا العصبية في الدماغ ومع المزيد من التجارب يحتفظ الدماغ بأفضل هذه الروابط والوصلات وهذا ما نريده نريده أن يحتفظ بالوصلات التي تعزز التعلم والطيبة والاحترام وحين يلعب الكبار مع ويستجيبون له باهتمام ويظهرون له الحب والرعاية فهذا يساعد دماغ الطفل في تطوير هذه الروابط والوصلات والاحتفاظ بها طب جاد بصير ألعب معك so we can pause it there. Thank طبعا you. So that's that that structure of that video is the general structure that we provide um, experts providing the, the the foundational theoretical skills, and then it's modeled by characters from the TV show to really combine both um, that expert advice with a more informal, uh, more accessible modeling of that theoretical information. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Zoe. Great, thanks so much, Kim. And last but not least, uh, we have George Zaham from Solidarité International. Hello, everyone. So I'm George Zaham from Solidarité International, and I work as a community manager on the project of the Solis bot. It's a chatbot based on over WhatsApp. Wait, I'm going to share my screen. OK. So what is the Solis WhatsApp bot project? Uh, so first of all, refugees have a difficulty accessing information due to the high uh, cost of, to access Solidarity International's hotline. Also due to limitations in movement due to recurring COVID-19 restrictions, as well as the need to wait for a humanitarian worker to visit to ask any questions. So the needs became clear for us I, that we needed to create a tool that can give 24 seven free access to communication channel between the organization and the refugee communities, while also improving the access in, to information in a faster and easier way for the refugee populations. 
After several researches in the field, we've noticed that 92% of uh, Syrian households own at least one mobile phone. 85% of these households have access to Wi-Fi, and over 80% of these Syrian refugees use WhatsApp on a regular basis. So what did uh, Solidarity International do? It created the Solis bot, which is a chatbot over WhatsApp. The user makes a request to the Solis bot that is analyzed by the machine, and then an instant real-time response is sent back to the user. The Solis bot was designed to facilitate humanitarian assistance and communications with Syrian refugees while offering access to information in a free, instant, and easy accessible way. How does the Solis bot work? The Solis bot looks like a, any normal conversation over WhatsApp, you could see on the right side. And the user uh, receives a menu list from the Solis bot with various topics at the covers. Later on, during the, throughout the project, we, we, uh, we came up with different ideas to add as features to the Solis bot. First of all, we created this broadcasting messaging, where the ability to broadcast a message to more than 10,000 unique individuals per day. We've also created the survey, uh, the feature of having surveys, by sending out surveys to the users to fill out uh, a set of questions all over WhatsApp for a fast input. Also, we, had, we added the feature of uh, people, uh, the ability for them to complain uh, or ask for assistance through a referral by also filling out these forms similar to the surveys. They come also as the form as a WhatsApp conversation where the bot asks a question and the person replies back. During COVID-19, the Solidarité International also came up with the idea to broaden the Solis bot project due to COVID-19 by introducing machine learning to the bot. What is machine learning? This means that the Solis bot will therefore be able to understand text received by end users and not just uh, uh, numbers or I'll be showing you a bit how it looks like the Solis bot. So here's a normal WhatsApp conversation that's occurring now. First of all, we send marhaba, which means hello. And just to show you, show you a simple uh, thing. And here on the side is the front end platform that is used by our team to follow up with the messaging. So whenever we send a marhaba, we receive automatically a message from the bot saying, hello, this is the Solis bot and describes a bit how the bot works. And then down here, we have a list of menu items you have number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. As well, we've added a voice messaging. Okay, each each number is used here. It was sent. We receive a specific a specific message about it. So, for example, if I send number one, it shows a bit uh, how the Solis bot works. It automatically replies back, and this is it. As for the front end platform here, we have access to a dashboard with all the information and data needed to know about what's happening. And we can easily access all the conversations that are occurring with the, with the chatbot, as well as any other features that are related to the, the bot itself. Thank you. Back to you, Zoe. Great. Thanks so much. I I think that it's it's really great. We have three different panelists that have all tried to provide you know information to communities in, in three very different ways. So I'm I'm excited for the discussion. Um, we we wanted to start with understanding how information landscapes have have shifted in the communities you serve over the course of COVID-19. So we thought, George, perhaps we we could start with you in Lebanon. How how did you see the information landscape shift over the past 18 months? Okay, so in Lebanon, uh, the, the, due to the uh, COVID-19, we had strict lockdowns where people were not able to access and uh, go out or move around. So as, as I mentioned before throughout the presentation, it's difficult for refugees to access uh, information because they have to either go and meet, meet someone in the humanitarian sector and ask them for questions, or they have to wait for the team to pass by them. So throughout the COVID-19, with the help of the Solis bot, people were now, are now able to just ask for any question they want uh, on the bot and they receive any, any information that they need. And were there any particular challenges among those communities um, it, that, that you saw that, that arose? Yes, of course. Uh, since since it's, uh, the communities are uh, many, many are like digitally illiterate, we had to produce uh, massive trainings to, to, to the, in the field with the teams, uh, of course, in the field to help uh, better understand the, the chatbot by itself and how does it work and how it is easily accessible. 
as well as having myself go down to the field and check with the people what information they would need on a daily basis to be added on the chatbot. Great, thanks so much. With Zoe, um, so maybe I'll just jump in and, and jump into the next session uh, with with Kim. I think, Kim, we were, uh, thank you Kate, for your answer. I think we were gonna move on to the kind of uh, next session with you and, and really discuss um, how did the use of mobile channels to distribute Sesame content change your, your programming? Uh, and, and what were some of the challenges that uh, you and, and, and Sesame faced uh, during the course of COVID-19? Yeah, thanks Guy. Um, so the plan to distribute mobile content was the plan prior to COVID. Uh, fortunately, again, because we were leveraging high rates of connectivity, I mean, George gave the stat about access to WhatsApp. So it's not just mobile phone, right? It's access to smartphone. Um, and that is inclusive of displaced Syrians as well as host communities across the region. Um, so that was always, we knew we wanted to leverage that those high rates of connectivity which we've seen from the research has only increased as a result of COVID. Um, the approach was a bit different in how you create content versus say a 26 minute television show versus uh, a four to five minute video that's for parents. And so we were very fortunate that the approach was planned prior to COVID um, and that the approach, the importance of the approach was really just reinforced as a result of COVID. Um, the big change that came from us was the need and importance of this information for parents, particularly uh, given how severe some of the lockdowns were in the region. Um, we found that parents through our research, both again and again our on reach data, that parents were really demanding this information and more. Um, they, as, as parents around with dealing with young children at home knew you became everything, right? You became the school teacher, the therapist, dealing with your own sort of uh, mental health issues as well. Um, and so it really heightened the importance of short form parenting videos that parents felt that they could watch together with their children because of the inclusion of the Muppets. Even though they were for parents, the Muppets signaled um, that they were also child friendly. And so we found that that was really important. Um, and then certain aspects of the videos, particularly around stress management and the importance of parenting around brain building, the video that we saw earlier, um, became even more critical as parents were becoming children's teachers as well, um, given school-related lockdowns or remote learning. Thanks so much, Kim. I think I'm back now. Um, so I, I, I think, one of the, the challenges that we talk a lot about in our team is, is how to deliver information over digital channels in a trustworthy way. Um, often trust is, is a human connection and, and while staying socially distanced was a, a requirement during the pandemic, that, that element of, of building trust with, with users remained really important. Um, so perhaps, Katie, we could start with you this time. Uh, the IRC was obviously tackling very sensitive topics with your Quentinotes platform. How did you manage to build trust with users online? Yeah, um, building trust is, is, is quite tricky, particularly in such a um, really complex environment like uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, and complex in the sense that uh, people live in constant and consistent um, uh, situations of violence and it's normalized and it's and it's something that they have to deal with every day how to you know get to their homes without being affected by gang violence how to work without being affected by gangs how to um, go to school without being affected um, and so it, it people are, the, the, the society tends to close and be very um, weary of, of outsiders. And that makes trusting service providers in general um, and seeking out support more difficult. Um, with technology platforms, um, typically we can, we, we generally think, you know, there's going to be this, this gap of, of building trust and it, and it does take time. Um, but here in Central America, we, we really saw uh, our Quintinos platform 
um, the fact that it was anonymous and provided sort of a blanketed security um, to people to be able to come in, um, seek support, and, and not have to identify who they were, right? One of the biggest things that our clients tell us is that when I go to get any sort of service, the first thing they ask me for is my ID. Um, and that automatically is going to break down uh, any trust that you could build with somebody because you now have their personal information. Uh, we don't do that on Quintanos. We don't ask for any personal information, no identifiable information. So obviously we're um, sort of sacrificing some of those maybe M&E pieces that we, we would love to have, but we really prioritize that building of trust. The trust gets built over time. You have to create a, 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 an online presence. You have to create a profile and you have to um, not only create it yourself, but have others around you, like local organizations um, also engage in that. Uh, so <clears throat> we were really able to, to engage a lot of our local partners in, um, in building up that, that sort of clout as, as a platform um, and, and also uh, engage local partners in, in using the platform for their population. So not look at it as just a user, um, a client uh, usage, but also a partner usage and, and kind of a snowball effect of being able to, to use it for others that may not be comfortable with technology um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and we have seen that people, um, once they see that there's a response and they see that the information you give them and the services that you give them have actually been validated, it's real. Somebody answers the phone, you know, um, and, and that we respond immediately um, during the time that we have published, which are very simple things, but here uh, definitely isn't always the case. Um, so uh, I think that builds up um, uh, trust. I think, uh, We've had several people that, you know, uh, we've seen many cases where people write in time after time, right? They write in today because they have a situation where they, you know, are living in a situation of violence and they go to the shelter and then in the shelter, they have another situation because there's somebody got sick and then, you know, it, and, and, and they do build a relationship with the, with the platform and with the moderators that are attending um, their, their questions and, and, um, it does take time though. I think any, as, as any other relationship when we're building community um, relationships or trust within communities, it's the same thing online. Uh, it's just, you do it differently. Yeah, thanks Katie. I love that idea of, of building cloud and trust over time through proving that you're actually gonna be there and that the information is, is verified. Um, George, how, how did your users react to the WhatsApp bot and, and how do you think that aspect of, of two-way communication uh, affected trust in your programming? Uh, so first of all, when we start, when we launched the Solus WhatsApp bot in the field with the people, of course, many people didn't trust it because they didn't understand what was the purpose behind it or how does it work or, and then throughout several trainings done in the field with the teams, are, are already they already work with the people in the field that, and the people already know them the, the trust started being built up slowly and slowly so first of all the bot was just as i said before it was just to access information and this is how the people started using it and become digitally literate to know more about it and then when we started launching other features on the bot slowly by slowly they the people started understanding more the purpose of the bot so of course, now that we have the complaints and the referrals where people have to fill out forms or a survey, we tend not to ask many questions about personal details unless it's asking for assistance where we have to come back to them and support them. But for them, since they feel like it's a digital thing then, and they trust like the web by itself and, and the concept of being in a humanitarian field, they feel like they can just put down their, their contacts and uh, complain in a way because if they usually, usually the process before was if they need to complain about someone's work or one of my colleagues in the field or anyone else, they used to have to call a phone number and talk to someone directly. And now they feel like this is like just over WhatsApp, there's a bit of anonymity about it. 
So they tend to now feel more free about complaining or even asking for assistance. And we, t we tended to notice that many people before were shy, like in the sense of, not, it's not shy, but in the sense of it. They used to uh, not want to call the hotline because they didn't want to ask for this question or they needed anything else. And now we see that it's much, much more people are, are using it in this way. Great, thanks, George. And I, I know during one of the, the stricter lockdowns in Lebanon, Solidarity faced some issues with individuals interacting with the bot claiming to be a, a French NGO falsely. How, how did you tackle that issue? Um, and, and how do you think the level of trust you already had with the community affected your ability to respond to this? Yeah, so back in February, uh, during the lockdown, we had a very strict lockdown. A group of people just went down uh, to the field and started taking down notes and asking people, claiming they were a French NGO. And for the people living there, residing in the, in the informal settlements, they many of them just know that we are the French NGO that is usually there. So they asked, uh, the people were asking for their contact details and asking the refugees about many different topics. So uh, the, uh, one of the people in the field asked our, our team uh, members if these people were, were part of our NGO. And uh, we noticed that it was a, case, a fraud case. So we decided to act immediately and we managed to send out automatically a broadcast to over 14,000 people throughout two days. As I mentioned before, it's 10,000 people a day, uh, unique users we can contact. And we sent them a brief message informing them that please watch out, there are people that are asking you uh, personal questions and that we are there for you at any time. And we, it's, not that, it's not us that uh, does such stuff. Yeah. Great. And, and Kim, I, Sesame Workshop obviously takes trust very seriously as, as well, basing your, your content creation on, on research, as you mentioned in, in the introduction. Could you tell us a little bit about how you do that? Yeah, since in creating the Ahlan Simpson universe, we've really been guided by research, both research that my team has led as well as market research to really make sure that the community is, is really leading in content creation, even the name uh, came from, from the communities we're serving, creation of the characters, creation of storylines, language that's incorporated into the script. And so we wanted to leverage what we knew was already a trusted brand that parents we know trust the TV show for their children. They trust it to watch with their children. They also trust for their children to watch it alone. So what we wanted to do in creating this content was kind of take that a step further in developing the scripts. We knew what we wanted the messages to be. What we didn't know is who is best positioned to deliver those messages. So we, we ran a study called a trusted messenger uh, formative study where we tested the same script, the script from on the importance of play in early childhood development with three different trusted messengers, a social worker, a caregiver, and a doctor. And we wanted to get a sense of, okay, this is the same message, but who, who is resonating with you? Who are you trusting this advice from? And from that, we learned particularly that social workers uh, were more preferred by parents for, for lots of different reasons. And the video that you saw, those were two social workers providing that, that guidance. But even more importantly, we found also what are the general traits of a trusted messenger? So again, even though it's caregiver facing because it included Muppets, they wanted um, the messenger to be appealing to kids. They wanted them to, of course, be an expert on the topic, but be able to explain it in a really simple, accessible way with lots of examples. Um, that's, that's making that sort of theoretical to applied connection. That was really critical for parents. Um, they wanted them trusted messengers to be positive, but kind. I don't know why I said, but like those aren't mutually exclusive, positive and kind. Um, and then also a dress, particularly for women um, was really important. They wanted to ensure that if the woman, a, a trusted messenger is going to be a woman that she was wearing culturally appropriate clothing. And so we took all of those findings and provided that to the education and production teams. And they really made sure that they incorporated that into the final product. And so in the final videos, the final six core videos, 
most of the content is delivered by social workers. The one exception is the video on nutrition. Parents were not um, re positively responsive to the doctor as a trusted messenger with the exception of the content on nutrition. They felt that that was more sort of biological and scientific, even though all of the videos are grounded in science and they really wanted to hear from, from a doctor. Um, so that video is delivered by a nutritionist and in our, in our performance evaluation that came out um, in terms of that parents share that they were trusting the experts who providing this guidance. So it's really how we continue to, to build on the existing trust is that we made sure that we were led by, by the communities who the videos are ultimately for. Great, and, and in terms of um, the choice of, of platform, um, I, I know that you guys made a, a decision to integrate with existing platforms. Can you talk us through how that decision was made and, what, and why you think that's important? Yeah, I think we found in, in this region as well as globally that it's in terms of integrating, it's, it's much easier to right, meet families where they're at rather than try to develop um, a new sort of viewing behavior, particularly in um, considering some of the restrictions. Yes, these are families that are highly connected, but they also don't have an unlimited amount of time online. And so they're really targeting um, where they spend their time online. And so we know that's a core set of apps or websites. Um, and so we really wanted to leverage that existing behavior. And that became even more apparent, particularly with the situation in Lebanon with limit, limited access to electricity, right? So you don't, you want to make sure that, we wanted to make sure that we were building on existing behaviors. Um, again, that goes back to the trust, right? These are also, these are existing behaviors because these are also apps and websites that families trust. So we wanted to make sure that we were integrating into existing behaviors and habits rather than trying to build um, new online behaviors. Great, thanks so much, Kim. So one, one, uh, one of the things that, that we talk about when we talk about the potential of technology in humanitarian settings is the ability to work efficiently at scale. Um, at the same time, one of the less talked about advantages is, is our ability to tailor information to unique local contexts using technology. And it'd be interesting to hear how these two advantages can be balanced in programming um, and, and how these are taken into account. So maybe Katie, we could start with you. How, how does Quentinos localize information uh, that it provides to users? Yeah. Well, first of all, we uh, Quentinos is, is is built off of local service providers, right? And um, and so that's something that from its uh, sort of birth, it's it's already being localized and localized in a very specific, um, methodical way uh, because we visit every service provider and we validate every service that's offered on the platform. Um, which means going to the service providers in, in non-pandemic times um, and, uh, and visiting them and, and ensuring that really that they, they are doing what they are say that what they say they're doing in terms of hours and, and services available and eligibility requirements and things like that. Um, and then and so we have 300 over 370 um, service providers providers available on the platform um, in the three countries and then more than uh, 1600 um, points of service. So that's uh, one part of the localization. Now we know, um, uh, and, and from so, sort of the larger signpost um, output, there are our, our, our sort of iterations of signposts or Quentinos in other countries looks different, right? Um, and, and when we came into to Northern Central America, um, the big thing that came out in every assessment that we did was the need for um, safe access to information that was trustworthy. Um, and, and, and so that's, I think, something that we built 
Quentinos off of, knowing that we didn't want to just connect people to services. We wanted to also provide real-time information about things that were important to them, about things that were current. Um, and so tomorrow, if there's a hurricane, we're providing information about where people can go, where are their shelters available, where are their, it, it's, it's constantly changing, right? And so part of localization is being able to um, be fluid. And, and be responsive to, to what people need at the time, because what you need today isn't necessarily what we're gonna need tomorrow in terms of information. Um, and, and, and that also, I, I think, is, is, is quite important when we're talking about misinformation, um, because the misinformation that I can have in Honduras will not be the same that we have in Guatemala. It won't be the same in the highlands of Guatemala versus in the city um, and, and, and all of these different things. So um, I, I think that's another big piece. Uh, finally, the, something that was very clear to us um, when we uh, start, we first started Quentinos in El Salvador, then expanded to Honduras and then to Guatemala in terms of, of rollout. And there were vast differences in the way that people um, want to see content, the way that they want to uh, really engage with content. So in uh, El Salvador, people were really receptive to written um, content. Now, they didn't want a lot of written content, but they wanted something written, something that they could look at. Um, in Guatemala, people didn't want written content. They didn't want things that were just written. Um, and part of that is because there are more than 25 indigenous languages in Guatemala, um, including also Spanish and, and Garifuna and some other um, uh, languages. But it, it they they really said we want things audio we want things video um and so that's when we started to connect uh our social media presence and and campaigns and and partners um doing webinars facebook lives um making little stories and vignettes and and, and different types of content right um because we started with very simple articles on our quintinous platform that were just like a few points of, of, of text and um, maybe a paragraph here or there, but it, it was something quite simple and, and receptive to those that wanted to read. Um, now, we uh, also started not just changing the type of content, but changing language. Um, we, with the, the GSMA funded um, a project particularly, uh, we went into making content for the NAM speaking population and in, in Guatemala, as well as, um, as the uh, Quiche. And uh, it, it, was, it was something that was quite challenging and it's something that we're expanding upon um, because when you look at just the characters that are available um, through the content developer, all of these things are, are things that you have to think about and build out. And um, if we want to reach the most vulnerable populations within these countries, we have to also be willing to change the way that we're delivering information. Um, it, it was interesting because in, in Guatemala, they also told us we I don't want te I don't want texting. I don't want writing with people when I'm receiving information from a moderator. I want to hear it via audio. Um, and it's really something cultural um, because you're already potentially working outside of language um, that that they're not. It's not their first language. Um, so that's that's I think one of the the most important things. We also did an information needs assessment in the beginning um, and and did some insights and impact assessment, particularly in Guatemala for indigenous populations, um, just to know what users wanted what was important to them in terms of information. Um, it, we uh, are really looking in, in the future to uh, build an integrated language translator. Um, there are a few different options that we've had in, in other places where IRC um, works with that and, and, and has been quite successful. Uh, we're also seeing needs of, of transnational migrants um, from Haiti 
Uganda, Cameroon, um, particularly Haiti right now. Uh, and so there's new language needs all the time. Um, and, and so we're also looking at how can we um, uh, give that information to those that know, most need it, particularly those that are on the move. Um, and then in our safe spaces that we're also a component of this project, um, the, our local partners, were the ones that really led the implementation of that. We provided technical support, technical guidance, um, capacity building, but they know that the, the LGBTQI population um, and our partners that represent them know them so much better than we will ever be able to know them. And they were, you know, sort of very critical in being able to tell us okay, this is, this is your methodology. It works for women and girls. This is what we need to do to change it for our population, um, whether that's uh, gay men or trans women or whoever it was. That's you know something that was really important in, in terms of changing our approach and localizing it, ensuring that um, it represented the populations that we were wanting to serve. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Lots of good stuff in there. I feel like we're starting to see a few themes around the importance of, of user research and information landscaping, the importance of responsiveness and, and responding to, to user needs. Um, maybe over, over to you, George, could you talk us through um, how the Solar Spot caters specifically to the, the Syrian refugee population and, and how you make sure that it's localized and locally relevant? Okay, so first of all, as you have seen before when I showed you a bit the bot, it's of course in Arabic, and this is because it's the national language uh, for Syrian refugees, but we've tried to cater it in a way so that uh, the typing that we're using, the, the text that we're using is is in the Syrian, di Syrian dialect by itself. So we I've done several researches and asked uh, people around, so because Lebanese, the dialect is very similar to theirs, but there are some keywords that, uh, that are different. And of course, with the help of the team that is working in the field with the refugees, of course, uh, we've tried to cater as much as we can uh, the language to be fully in the Syrian dialect. Of course, throughout the project, we've asked uh, several refugees, like selected through throughout several surveys that we've done or throughout focus group discussions, and we've noticed if the, te the text that is being used uh, is easy to understand for them or we needed to, to to adapt to different things. Of course, always we are adapting the text as much as we can so that everyone can understand it, even because in, through, throughout Syria, we have different dialects that are, are being used and different key terms. So sometimes we add the parentheses where the word is, uh, is used in a different dialect for them. Of course, we've also noticed that uh, when, I, when we launched the bot at the, at the beginning, it was only tech by text. And as you have seen, uh, I've showed you throughout the present throughout the short presentation that there were voice notes being added to through every with every text that is being sent. So we've noticed that many people don't do not read nor and cannot cannot uh, they use their WhatsApp on a daily basis, yes, but they use it throughout voice notes. So we've added the feature of having someone read the, the message for them, and uh, it's, it's easy, much easier for them now. And as you have seen before, I've showed you also on the bot that every time someone needs to ask any question, they have to send a number. So technically speaking, uh, we've, uh, we've checked with many illiterate that they, most of them know how to use the phone number, to use their phone just to send a number. But we've also added the feature of having the emojis. So if someone cannot send number one or number two, doesn't know how to send them, he can send a smiley, each smile, and it's, it's uh, you can see it and it's said in the voice note for the people. Of course, we've also always managed to, to adapt and, and improve so that everything is being understandable by everyone. So for example, throughout the complaints and referrals that I've mentioned before, uh, there was one question which included the asking them for the like code number that is sent by UNHCR to the refugees. And in this number, there's only one uh, English alphabet that is being used. It's usually a C or an L or any, any other alphabet. And many of them, we've noticed that don't even have an English keyboard on their phone. So we've managed to add the feature of them sending an actual picture of the number that they have on the document and is being and is, and it's automatically being sent to our team and uh, they can follow up with them. As I mentioned also with the machine learning process, we are trying to create 
of course, uh, like uh, artificial intelligence for the bot so that they could, the bot can understand the text and not just these numbers. So we are already, we've already uh, worked on it and now we are in the testing phase and we will soon try it out with, uh, with the refugees directly where the person asks for the question by themselves. They say, hello, the bot replies, hello, how can I help? And the person asks, hey, I need help. Uh, I need uh, like uh, fixing my, I need to fix my toilet. And then the bathroom, uh, the, the bot <laughs> knows how to, to continue with the questions. So that's it basically. Thank you, Zora. Back no, thank you. I, I mean, I think that leads really well into to Kim. We wanted to know your your content was developed to be shared across Jordan, Lebanon, and and Iraq. And you talked about scale in your introductory remark. So, how how do you within Alan Simpson balance this need between scale and and locally relevant? Locally yeah, accessible? I mean, it's it's an ongoing. Uh, challenge i think because we want whenever someone watches our content we want them to see themselves in the characters um and so because the the videos that we're talking about particularly here for parents were for jordan uh, iraq and lebanon they are available to anyone um middle east and north africa any arabic speaker um and so Again, building on some of the research we've done around language preference for our core audience, as well as in in other um, countries across the region, like UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, that's really reflected in the show and that characters speak with different dialects, um, both the human characters as well as the puppeteers behind the core um, Ahlan Simpson Muppets. And so that's 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 kind of an, an entryway for, for more inclusiveness. Again, that, that no matter where you are, you hear yourself um, represented in our characters. What we also did for, for these videos, is, and this is something we heard from parents, is that so the experts speak in a much more formal dialect and parents uh, across the, the context that we tested, that made it credible to them but it was the informal engagement of the Muppets that made it really real. Um, so in terms of that language, what we found is that parents felt that the language was inclusive, but it was actually the visuals that were making the, the content accessible across the region. That, and that's sort of a, a core guiding principle of any content uh, that we make, that in order for it to be a defect, effect, not defective, effective, you should be able to watch our content on mute and still understand the core messages. And so you could see in the video that I showed earlier that um, Jod was using straws to create the pathways between the different homes as modeling for the links between the neural pathways. So those were all very visual elements. And so that, so the, the importance of uh, visual signals becomes really, really important when we're trying to navigate that locally contextualized content at scale. Um, so those are, so dialect and then the visual cues are really the, the two pathways that we pursued to make sure that families could access the content, could see themselves in it, and could take away the messages, even if they weren't able to connect with the dialect uh, directly. Great, thank you all so much. I think there's a lot in there um, and, and some really interesting complimentary lessons that have been pulled out. We have a few questions from uh, the audience and um, please feel free to add more because we're now in the Q&A section. So if you have any questions, now is your time. Um, but I'll start with the, the two that we have. Um, so in, in any of the platforms, so this is a question for any of you, how have you been sharing, filtering, or adapting information from national or international sources? So for example, the government uh, or the WHO, or is all information created within your organizations? Would anyone like to take that one? I can take it. Um, so on Quentinos, it's, it's, a, it's a mix. Uh, we share national information that has been vetted, and that is um, uh, something like, for example, where are the COVID vaccination centers is something we would share because that's a fact, right? 
Um, now, we do not share any national information that is politically swayed or has any um, sort of uh, opinion um, base. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a very particular differentiation. Now, I will say that the national information from the government is really important because a lot of the services that are available are only available through them. And so we have to um, build that into our platform um, and it's an integral piece, but we also have to vet the information and if there has to do with services, what we tend to find a lot of times that there are a lot of numbers and a lot of services available. And then when you call them or you um, actually try to uh, validate those, they, they don't, they're not being offered, they don't exist. Um, and in terms of uh, things like uh, WHO or, or other um, uh, sort of more global guidelines, we, um, we did, we did uh, particularly surrounding COVID um, and, and sort of trying to combat misinformation um, with uh, how to prevent COVID and um, what the vaccine does and those sorts of things um, definitely relied on, um, on, on international best practice in terms of, of the messaging that was coming out. Um, uh, and, and some of that was um, WHO, um, some of that was also coming from, from national governments that were um, basing their public health guidelines on um, international standards. Thanks, Katie. George, do you have anything to add on that one? Were you um, filtering, adapting, sharing any national or international information? Yes, of course, we've been uh, doing the same thing. Uh, for example, we have uh, information about COVID-19. We've shared stuff sent to us by, uh, we've asked for it from the UNHCR and uh, with the help of WHO. And of course, we've added uh, a link to the vaccination uh, uh, for people to get vaccinated. And this is a link that was shared by the government to everyone living in Lebanon. And we've added them, of course, to the chat bot. Great, thanks. I have um, another question from the audience is, is how do you target people or communicate information about the platforms uh, to reach people who might, who might not know of your organization already? Kim, do you wanna start on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think this was also, so we we shared our content on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube again, um, but to the point that that's not reaching all people who may be interested um, in or in, in demand of the content. So we also integrated the content through our partner IRC and their direct services provided to parents and caregivers, both um, the limited in-person that took place in COVID as well as the remote programming across the region. And so that was, that was I think, critical to making sure that we were able to still deliver the content to those who may not have been aware that the content was available on other platforms or may have not had access to it for whatever different reason. Um, so that's really where it becomes critical for us to partner with really strong implementing partners who have relationships directly with the community. Katie or George, anything to add? Uh, so from our side, uh, we already have like a big database of, uh, of the beneficiaries that we work with and we are only targeting them at the moment because we want to, to reach out to the people that we already work with. So we directly work with them Instantly, and of course, newcomers are always uh, updated to our database. Yeah, we do um, localized targeting via social media um, for Quentinos, um, so we can we can decide what geographic area we would like to target, what demographics we'd like to target. Um, but that, like Kim said, is, is just one piece of the puzzle. It's it's social media, right? Um, and not everyone is either connected to social media or using um, technology, digital technology in general. And so um, I, I think the platform piece is something that's harder uh, for, for access and we have to have multiple entry points. 
um, something that is pretty much universal in, in um, Central America, except for maybe a, a, a portion of the older population um, and, and very young population is WhatsApp. Um, and so because our platform is integrated into a cloud center, a communication center with WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, um, that is a, is a huge plus. Um, I think also utilizing uh, our partners as a filter, um, as I mentioned earlier, to, to use the platform for people or to guide people using the platform is also um, the way that we really were able to reach people that you just weren't going to reach via digital technology. And, and um, I would say, you know, targeting specific populations, it has to be coupled with messaging. So if we wanted to target people that were affected by mental health um, uh, issues, then the messaging that we would put out in our content for uh, that month would be around mental health, right? Because people see the content, they identify with it, and then they write in um, or, or contact uh, for more information. So it's all about the, the sort of messaging that's, that's being put out. And, um, I, I think it, it, there are some limitations in terms of targeting, right? Like you, whenever you use social media, particularly, you're getting, um, the, it's never going to be 100% science and, and it's, you're going to get some blanket population, right? And so I think that we just have to know and acknowledge. Great, thanks. Um, when when deciding to move forward with mobile technology, what sort of scoping did you do initially to establish that this would be a viable medium to reach your intended audiences? Uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone wants to take that one. Um, I can I can uh, jump in. So our um, part of our 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 work, I, I think I may have mentioned this through our particularly through our market research team was is was and is to conduct ongoing media landscape studies to really understand connectivity. Um, and so that has been clear to us since we've started this work uh, several years ago that, that this is where families are and they are continuing to go there. That, that, that connecting and accessing content through mobile technology is only going to increase. Um, and so we've seen that significantly um, through this work and through some of the, the work that GSMA commissioned on this work, 53% of families said that their mobile use had increased during COVID and already three quarters of them were watching videos online every day. So it's right, we're already at high rates and somehow continue, those are continuing to build. So it became very, very clear from the ongoing research that this is a really um, critical way to reach families now and in the foreseeable future. Katie, did you want to add to that? I know that you talked a little bit about the, the scoping work that, that IRC did as well. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, when we first started, we did an information needs assessment. So we looked mm -hmm. at what technology are people using within the three countries? What information do people most need? Um, so, and, and how do they seek that? Who do they trust to get information? Um, what, uh, what does the actual like in digital technology infrastructure look like? So where is there, where is there more access? Where is there less access in terms of geography and, and populations? Um, it, it, it really showed us some stark differences between the three countries, which was quite interesting, um, but also showed us some very strong commonalities. And we really focused that information needs assessment on the populations that we were targeting within the project, uh, which, as I mentioned before, were uh, survivors or, or women and girls that were at risk of gender-based violence and uh, the LGBTQI population. Um, and so we, we really tried to focus in on those populations information needs, not on global um, sort of generalities uh, in terms of information. And then um, 
uh, when we when we switched into Guatemala, we did do an impact and insights assessment, which really wanted to look at how do you want to receive that information, right? Um, what's going to work best for this population, and um, and then you know we also are, are constantly analyzing um, the 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 analytics behind the content that we're producing. Um, so when uh, we do a Facebook Live or a webinar um, that engages our local partners as, as part of the uh, presenters or as part of the, 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 the digital content makers, <laughs> um, uh, creators, uh, it, it has shown to be much more um, engaging and effective. We have more people um, come in and uh, more people stay. And, and so we're also looking at that, how usage um, looks and, and when we put out content, um, what, what are people more interested in? And then through our live moderation service, what kind of messages are we getting? What are the trends for asks for information? And then changing our content that we're putting out based on that. Great. Thanks. And I had one comment specifically for, for George. Um, this person said Solidarity previously ran a customer service hotline um, that was able to deal with a smaller number of requests and with people increasingly having the ability to register complaints and referrals uh, via your platform. How are you making sure that you're dealing with each of these referrals in a time effective manner now that you're reaching a larger scale? Uh, so now that we are reaching a much, much larger scale than just a uh, hotline, uh, the team uh, that is working uh, on following up in the accountability department, are uh, there are more people now working on the team. And of course, uh, we, we've, we've decided that within 72 hours, we will try to follow up with the person directly and contact them back as, uh, as much as we can. But of course, uh, throughout now the training, and since we are still... Uh, working on always improving it. We, throughout the training of the people, we've informed them and we've written a small message on to the bot that, uh, of course, since now we're still in like the first phase of the project, uh, we are sorry if we cannot answer within the first 72 hours, but we are managing to follow up. And so there's a one person dedicated all day long to just follow up and read all the complaints and details that we are receiving. Great, thank you. I wondered um, before we, I have one wrap up question for all of you, but before we go there, I wondered, um, Alnap has sort of set out this, these three ways that change can happen from evolution or you know incremental change over time, revolution, which is more transformative change uh, and status quo, which are short-term adaptations that are likely to revert back. And I think all three of you have talked about different changes that happened over the course of the pandemic from Kim, you saying a lot of this information being more relevant to parents and them really needing it. George, uh, different sorts of things coming up and, and needing that sort of two-way communication and, and responsiveness. And, and Katie, people searching for online uh, spaces uh, where, where they could find safe, locally relevant information. I wondered from, from your perspectives, these changes, do they, do they fall into that characterization? Do you think they're evolutionary, revolutionary, or, or, or status quo? Katie, what do you think? Maybe we start with you. Sure. I think, I think there are definitely some evolutionary pieces um, and also some revolutionary pieces and, and then some pieces that are status quo, right? I think we realize that we can do a lot more with a lot less um, resources than, than we had previously thought because we, uh, particularly in, in service provision and connection to services, we, you know, the, the, the gold star is, is in person, right? Um, and that's what we've we've always thought. But I think that um, it's obviously it's not just a humanitarian aid world thing. It's a overall people have started to rethink what working means, what what it means to do good work. Do you have to be there physically? Can you do it digitally? And that's been, I think, reflected in, in more non traditional um, policies within organizations, within donor um, landscapes. 
Um, and, and then I think also within the way that we're utilizing re and distributing resources, um, particularly in, uh, in, in delivering services to um, the population. Now, I, I do think that <laughs> um, there are some, some sort of caveats to that digital revolution, if you wanna call it um, that, or, or evolution, because everyone was already using technology before, right? Um, and, and this is just a different way of using it. And I, I think that some things, um, we, we can't replace. I, I think there's always going to be a space for, um, you know, in, in our safe space work, that there, there's nothing that can replace the, the person to person um, interaction and the sort of uh, empowerment that that gives to um, potential survivors of violence. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not going to be replaced, but it can be enhanced um, with, with digital technology. Um, and I, I also think that some things we, we weren't necessarily um, ready for in, in terms of uh, using technology at a massive uh, level. And, 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 and that's probably part of the, the piece that we need to, to look at more with any revolution, you have some surprises. So, um, you know, what does that mean for security? Um, what does that, you know, there are different security concerns that, that have come up within this. Um, how do you deal with client satisfaction? Something that, that um, George was just kind of touching on. Um, and, and then feedback mechanisms, how do you manage them uh, when, when you get a certain amount. And it, there are a lot of pieces that I think we need to think more about, um, particularly in, um, in ensuring that we're not um, getting ahead and in ensuring that we're also using the information, right? This is, we have a massive amount of data now and information about uh, the, 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 all of the different um, Seeking, seeking pieces of seeking out information. What are people looking for? Where are they? How can we use that now to improve our programming? Right, I think is, is something that we also need to, to focus on. George or Kim, anything to add? Otherwise I have one more that came in from the audience. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to what um, Katie was sharing. I think that the evolution in terms of people were already using digital and now we're just evolving those behaviors in different ways by creating new ways to engage with digital. I think there is a for there's a revolutionary element uh, in terms of providing parents making science accessible. I think I mean I feel like I'm a little biased here, but I do think that's revolutionary. Um, that and we have seen this in the past is that parents really want to know the why, right? They're, it's not that they're against that X, Y, and Z are foundational for early childhood development, but they really want to know the science behind it. And so by making science accessible, um, I think that, you know, this is sort of a springboard for, for continuing that sort of revolutionary aspect and using digital to do it, to provide it again at scale. Great, thanks, Kim. I think that's really important. Um, one, one last question from the audience is, is, is there anything that you would advise other organizations not to do? Um, and then maybe touching on some of the challenges uh, involved in developing these platforms. George, do you wanna start us off on that one? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Was, challenges uh... in developing the platform. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, there are several challenges that uh, that have occurred, and but always I think the most important thing is not just to focus on the platform by itself, but also to focus on what the people need when we are working with them. So not not just have uh, like an idea on our mind and just focus on just working with this way. We of course we, all, everything has to be amended. Everything in a, we should be flexible when we are working on such things because. It's very new to our to our to every humanitarian agency to work and with the, with all of this tech, 
So we have to be as much flexible as we can just to cover up as much work as we want as, and be flexible with whatever uh, we need. Katie or Kim, you want to add to that one? Um, I think some of what I was sharing earlier about integrating into existing behaviors, I, if you're uh, particularly if you are trying, if it's relatively quick response at, at, at scale, like I know I keep mentioning at scale, um, I would not recommend trying to create a new pathway of digital behaviors, particularly with families who, again, may be highly connected, but have limited time online. Um, and then, again, I'm biased here, but I do think a lot of times in humanitarian settings, there is such a focus on uh, immediate emergency response for obvious reasons, bypassing user research. And I, given right the, the protracted nature of a lot of things that we're dealing with, that um, in the short end maybe may work out, but in the long term, um, not doing that sort of needs assessment, formative research, I, I would not recommend that as an approach to any sort of intervention or content creation process. Great, thanks so much. So I'm just gonna summarize what I think are some of the, the key themes that came out of today. And then I'm gonna ask you all um, in, in our last 10 minutes to share a few thoughts on lessons to, to take forward. Um, so, I, I mean, I think from my perspective, there was a lot that came out around that last point around the importance of user research, the importance of, of understanding current online or digital behaviors, about understanding user preferences, both in terms of what information they need, but also how they want to receive it. Uh, so I, I think all three of you mentioned the importance of understanding you know, is it, is it text-based? Is it coming from a social worker? Is it voice notes? How and, and what do people want? And the importance of, of being responsive. Also local languages, I think um, came out quite strongly, the importance of local dialects, representation, and, and making sure that this content is, is accessible to the audiences that, that you're providing it for. Um, Responsiveness in terms of, of relevance, so both the Solus bot having two-way communications and IRC's platform really shifting their content based on, on the needs of the users, I thought was a, a really interesting, great point. Um, and, and building trust by building that track record and, and showing that you can point people towards locally relevant um, information that, that they can act upon is is super important. And then building on existing local infrastructures um, and local actors, I think that came out in IRC's programming especially, but, um, but I thought that was a great point as well. Um, yeah, and, and so those are, those are some of the points that I wrote down that I thought were really excellent from today. Um, now I'd like to give you all a chance um, to, to talk about lessons for the future. So as we know, the humanitarian sector has a notoriously bad memory in terms of learning from past interventions, past responses. What do you think are the key lessons uh, from the past 18 months and, and how do we ensure that, that we take them forward? I'll ask this to each of you, but perhaps we could start with George. Yes, uh, of course, uh, there are many things to learn from these from all of what happened with COVID-19 and all the lockdowns and all how the humanitarian work uh, has developed. So first of all, uh, work from home systems uh, were created even to work with refugees directly. So for example, our chatbot, uh, with the help of the chatbot, we can communicate directly with a two-way communication with these refugees. So for example, other than that, uh, as we mentioned, that uh, surveys and complaints and any other uh, like asking for assistance can also be developed in a way not necessarily to have an individual going there or anything. Now with this two-way communication that we've created, it's very easy to access uh, uh, the people in the field and uh, contacting them in an easier, easier way. So um, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, these, the, the service bot as, as is, had us also like learn to build trust with the people in a different way. People feel that it is much more trustworthy, as I've mentioned before, 
and it's easier for them to, to feel free and to complain or ask for any help. So that as, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, the, they feel like uh, another thing is that on, with these complaints and referrals that we were mentioned, I've mentioned about, we are now adding like other features so that people could follow up with this, with their complaint or the referral that they've asked for. In the past, people had to like wait and wait and wait. So with the, all of this technological advancement, we've seen that many, many features can be added, many things to easily act, uh, reach out to the people. And of course, with this new technology that we're using, we are reaching a much larger scale with a much larger population to, to target and to, to reach out to them and support them in any easier and easier way. So that's basically it. So I, of course, I've, I recommend everyone to like go into these technologies as we are moving into the future, things are going much faster. So these are ways to help us like easily uh, access different, uh, different topics in the humanitarian field. Thanks so much, George. Katie, over to you. Thank you. So some of, I think the lessons um, for the future I already mentioned in terms of the uh, uh, learning about with with larger scale comes um, and, and the use of technology, I think, come uh, unique and risks um, and, and trying to take those into account for the future. Um, I, I think we need to also um, continue to listen. We need to continue to listen to our our clients. And that doesn't just mean what they say. It means what is their usage, what's happening um, within the within the context, um, what are they seeking in terms of information, what's important in that moment, right? Um, and, and I think uh, part of that listening also means um, being adaptive, um, being able to adapt to new contexts, new needs, um, particularly on the information front, but also knowing that um, with new context, it can come, it can bring uh, gaps, right? And, 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 and being able to uh, fill those gaps. And in our case, that was in a particular area of service provision. Um, but in, in, in other, you know, cases, it, it could be something else. Um, but paying attention and listening to, to what are those needs and then what are the gaps that are coming up and knowing that it's not going to be um, something that is static. It's going to be something that's constantly changing. Um, I think we need to also keep evolving um, in, in terms of the way that we're delivering uh, digital um, uh, services or, or information via digital means, uh, knowing that what's again, useful today or receptive today may not be tomorrow. Um, and, and it's really important to keep our eyes sort of on the that market research side that Kim was Kim was mentioning. Um, and and also expanding our populations um, uh, and the targeting that we're doing with the content we're creating. So, you know, if we're going to start wanting to reach youth, we're going to have to create different content to reach youth. Um, if we want to reach the subsector of um, trans women within the LGBTQI population, we need to know that they are probably better at using social media than we will ever be because they have been using this to communicate within their community for years. And, um, and, and let's, let's follow their lead. Let's listen to them and, 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 and evolve um, based on, on, on what works for them. And then I, I think our biggest risk within um, the use of digital technology um, particularly in, in providing information is um, getting ahead of ourselves and forgetting about quality. Um, and, and so I think really trying to measure um, the expansion of provision of information with uh, and, and balance that with the, the provision of quality services is something that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, in knowing that uh, you can provide as much information as, you, as you'd like, but if there is nothing to respond to those needs, um, then we need to start looking at more two-pronged approaches um, uh, rather than just the facilitation of information. 
Um, and, and knowing that digital reality is here to stay, like it's, it's here. Um, now, how we choose to use, to utilize that to become more efficient and more effective in, in reaching the populations that need it the most is going to be up to us. Thanks, Katie. And over to you, Kim. Yeah, I just would build on everything that Katie and George have, have just shared. I think one of the big questions, I think this is echoing what they've, they've already said is, how is this work sustainable if future restrictions, movement restrictions are put in place? And so given that in humanitarian response, what are the ways that creating digital infrastructure is now needs to be part of humanitarian response? If we really, we, we see that use in highly connected communities, we're not able to reach all those who are affected by conflict, but there are also Right, large humanitarian communities who have very, very low rates of connectivity. And so COVID related restrictions are, you know, strengthening that gap. And so how do we explore that? How do we explore provision of, I don't know, of the, like solar panels, electric grids, you know, SIM card, how does this all become part of our humanitarian response? Um, and then echoing what Katie was saying about listening. To, to the communities. We, we added a couple of questions into a survey that um, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies runs in Lebanon um, with parents of young children. And we found that catching COVID was actually parents' slowest concern. It was everything else that was re related to COVID around lockdowns, um, supporting children's mental health and well-being, supporting their own mental health and well-being, establishing new routines. And so I think to echo back to the importance of research, right? Like research from the very beginning, from concept has to be integrated into the work that we do, even if it is emergency response. Uh, it, that, that has to be a lesson learned from all of this. Um, and then integrating those learnings, as Katie was saying, in terms of we have so much data now, what are we doing with it? Great, all excellent points. Thank you so much for, for leaving us with those. Um, I'll just say thanks to our donor FCDO and, and thanks to all of you uh, for, for sharing the learnings that, that you gathered. I thought it was a really rich discussion. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.